Until not that long ago, only an Innova could do what an Innova does. Seat 7 in comfort. Be good to drive and good to be driven in. Chew miles endlessly without a problem. Be absurdly reliable and of course, be safe. But today, the game has moved on and you have SUVs that can also seat 7. The XUV700, that seat 7. So does the Safari, so does the Alcazar, so does the Karens. And that's why Toyota have also moved the game on. The Hi-Cross is unlike any other Innova before it. It is front-wheel drive, it is a monocoque platform. It is a huge, huge improvement. And that's why in this test, we're going to find out if the Innova is still the benchmark in this test. We also have two little sub-tests going on. The Karens and the Alcazar, we've never had them together. We do right now. The XUV and the Safari, we've compared them in the past, but now the Safari has been updated with the new infotainment and all of that. The Red Dark versus the XUV700. Which one should you buy? That is also something that we will tell you in this test. And this is a big test. We've got a lot of cars. So Sirish is going to be focusing on how these cars are to drive. I'm going to be jumping into the second row, into the third row and talking about space. I'm even going to be opening the boot and show you what kind of space these SUVs have because desirability is key to owning an SUV in this segment, I'm going to be telling you about the styling and the kind of road presence these SUVs have. And of course, before we go ahead, you know the drill. Give us a shout out. Give us a like if you enjoy this video. Share this with like-minded enthusiasts. Stay subscribed to the Evo India channel and smash that bell icon to stay notified for all our video drops. The Hi-Cross is the latest member joining the seven-seater SUV club. And yes, this is an SUV. Gone are those days when the Innova was an MPV. The Krista, yes, is closer to an MPV. But the Hi-Cross, it's an SUV with its higher set shoulders, the bulging bonnet. If there's one thing that it lacks, it's the larger tyres. It doesn't fit the wheel well well. It's got 18-inch wheels, mind you. But considering the size of this car, it's the longest SUV in this comparison test. It's got the longest wheelbase as well. The tyres, they look a little under-tired. We start with the Innova Hi-Cross and we start in full electric mode. It's now running in pure electric mode and this is the hybrid. And the big difference between the earlier Krista and the Innova Hi-Cross is the silence. In the Innova, you always heard that diesel engine. You always felt the vibrations from the diesel engine. It wasn't uncomfortable, but now when you put that into perspective, after the high cross, when you jump into an Innova, it feels a bit crude. It feels a bit unrefined. This petrol hybrid powertrain is an absolute peach. Now the engine is running. You can feel a bit of vibration from the petrol two liter engine but it's hardly anything. You hardly notice the switchover from electric to combustion engine. There is a graphic out there that tells you what is feeding power to where and when the energy is being recovered. On the brakes, that's when the energy gets recovered and the battery gets charged up. But the transition is just so seamless. I'm doing 60 kilometers per hour right now and it's absolutely quiet. In fact, the only thing I can hear is the blower and the seat coolers. Otherwise, the powertrain, the refinement is just fabulous. And seriously, even when you compare it with the other cars that we have over here, the other SUVs that we have over here, most of them are diesel. And this, the refinement, the smoothness is next level. But then, this is also the Evo India channel. We also drive enthusiastically. So, stick it into power mode. There are these different drive modes. So, in power mode, you have the have the duster, the edges become red. The transmission, the engine, it gets more responsive. And then when you gun it, that's when you can hear the engine. It sounds a bit loud and because it's got this eCVT gearbox that actually makes the motor 
sound a bit strained sounds like it's struggling so toyota claims a 0 to 100 time of 9.5 seconds which is actually pretty quick it makes it one of the quickest cars in this test but the way the engine sounds that strained that it does when you are actually gunning it that doesn't give it a sense of enthusiasm the innova doesn't like being driven like that it likes a nice steady cruise and at a cruise it's quiet it's refined at times obviously when you want to overtake when you have to step on the gas like right now this is a comparison with the other SUVs that we have over here and even when you compare it with those this can easily keep pace with them on the highway this is quick this has enough power it really builds up speed very well and that's where i come to another aspect of the high cross and that is the platform now this is no longer a ladder frame this is a brand new monocoque the engine mounted transversely powering only the front wheels so see change from the cristas from the innovas of the past and it also makes a massive difference in terms of the way the high cross drives the stability on the highway there is no jumping around on these expansion joints it's so composed it's so stable and it is so easy to drive that easiness it starts with the steering it now gets electric power steering no longer the hydraulic power steering of the past and it's just so much lighter so effortless be it in the city or on the highway driving it is absolutely effortless zero work zero demands on you and because it is electric power steering toyota have managed to give it adas features also but it does not get forward collision warning that normally is the headline feature of adas features that the toyota innova does not get the high cross does not get that you do get blind spot warning that indicator comes on on the wing mirrors you get adaptive cruise control and you can switch it from adaptive to regular cruise control and also you get lane keep assist and lane change warning so useful features but forward collision warning is absent that's something that the xuv700 gets that's also something that the safari now gets that's absent on the high cross this is an mpv it is softly sprung so you go over a few corners go round a few corners and there is a fair bit of body roll also the wheels look really undertired these are 18 inch wheels but they seem very undertired when you look at the overall proportion of the high cross and also the grip levels are okay it's not like stunning front end grip and you can really lean on the front end none of that you can't do all of that but you can maintain triple digit speeds around corners it feels safe it feels composed if there are mid corner bumps that gets absorbed so the body doesn't go all over the place the point i want to make is that the c3 air cross was just recently unveiled that's a brand new mid size suv built for india by citroen that has a transmission tunnel the high cross is far bigger than a mid size suv and it does not have a transmission tunnel so toyota's engineers have been able to engineer good solid torsional rigidity in the high cross without needing a transmission tunnel but some things are inexplicable for instance this huge 10.1 inch infotainment screen it's very nice but the graphics look a little bit dated apart from that it actually eats into your field of vision so this is obstructing your field of vision there's also a big wing mirror out here so your left view is eaten into this then the reach to the horn pad that actually it hurts your thumb and when you drive in india you have to use the horn most of the time so you will be using that then also there's the fit finish like stuff like physical buttons for the volume that is good proper physical buttons for the aircon that's also good but the quality of these buttons aren't anything to write home about at least this is the gx variant so you get this piano black finish the vx variant 
it gets that hard scratchy plastic which is mm, not so good you get wireless carplay but wired android auto i don't know why that is okay you get a digital cluster but the graphics on that it just seems so old school so not contemporary like the digital cluster on the safari on the xuv700 even the alcazar it all looks so nice and premium this feels like an afterthought and in these small small areas that they've cut cost the buttons for the sunroof even the interior light is these buttons it's not like you press the lamp and it comes on the power window switches the central locking button that's not backlit so in the night when this is new to you you're struggling to find that you do get memory for the powered driver seat but you don't get powered passenger seat at the rear you get power recline but you don't get power for aft movement comfort i should also add the seats are excellent they are wide they are comfortable and they are supportive they're not like squishy and after a while you start getting a backache you can spend hours in these seats and they will be perfectly good the visibility is actually very good and you can actually dip the seats really nice and low so you get a nice driving position in fact after the high cross when you sit into something like the xuv700 the xuv700 seats feel too high compared to the high cross the high cross is actually positioned really well so in terms of that ergonomics they've got it really spot on and of course then i have to talk about the fuel efficiency so now driving it back to back on the highway with all these other suvs that we have here this is giving 13.8 kilometers to the liter from the heart of mumbai to the heart of pune when i drove it on the 1st of may which was a holiday so very little traffic all over it gave me around 13.3 kilometers to the liter so it is good and the claimed fuel efficiency is well above 20 kilometers to the liter so the fuel efficiency is good for something this big powered by a petrol engine this is obviously running the atkinson cycle because this is mated to the hybrid transmission the total power output is 181 bhp the petrol engine it puts out 188 newton meters and the electric motor it puts out 206 newton meters of torque so in terms of torque the diesel engines really have the measure of this petrol hybrid but in terms of power outright power with the claimed sub 10 seconds 0 to 100 time the high cross is more or less there it is on par the other thing is that there isn't much sound deadening on the high cross because there's no diesel engine to damp out the noise so they don't need much sound deadening which also means that you hear more of the outside traffic and you hear more of the drive train when you are actually revving it and asking for more power out of it other irritants with the high cross that you only realized after spending some extended time with the mpb is that the screen when you slow down it defaults into the camera view and then when you accelerate it goes back into your car play say if you have your maps on which might seem like a good idea except when you are in rush hour traffic for instance when you are in mumbai and you don't know the way and you're using your maps to navigate and every time you slow down the camera comes on then the maps come and then when it switches from the camera to the car play to the maps there is a delay it doesn't switch immediately all of that is irritating there's no reason to really have that it of course has a 360 view camera and you can switch it off but you have to double tap the view button or you tap the cross mark on the screen and the resolution of the camera that also isn't good the high cross gets ventilated seats which is great for the indian summer but these ventilated seats are only for the driver and the passenger and think about it the high cross will mostly be chauffeur driven the owner will be sitting at the back so shouldn't the captain seats in the middle get ventilated seats and not so much the front two seats and that's where tata's product planning actually comes to the fore because in the safari you get ventilated seats also in the middle captain seats anyway to talk more about the rear seats and the space let's toss over to atish
the second row of the Innova High Cross. Now, as you can see, you've got a ton of space in here. The High Cross is the most spacious car in this test by a significant margin. The knee room I have here is excellent. The head room I have here is excellent. This is the seven seater version of the High Cross, which means you get captain seats in the middle row and three seats in the rear. And in terms of space and comfort, it's unbeatable. Just look at the seats and the features that it offers as well. You've got this Ottoman that flips out electrically. The recline is electrical again. You've got a tray table over here. This feels a little flimsy, but it's really practical. Other cool stuff on the high cross. You've got a separate zone climate control with the auto button. You can control the fan speed. You can even control the temperature right here from the second row. You've also got two USB type C ports in the second row and this blind. Now, drawbacks of the Innova High Cross's second row. Well, firstly, if you flip this ottoman too far out, your legs get caught under the front seat, which is not really practical. You have to be really short or you've got to curl your legs up to enjoy the ottoman. Secondly, this slides on rails and you've actually got a massive amount of adjustability. But if you take it too far in front, you have no space for your feet because the hybrid batteries are under the front seats of the car. So you've just got to give yourself a little bit of leeway with space for your feet and then you're comfortable over here. Now getting into the third row of the Innova High Cross is a two-step process. One, you've got to slide this forward. If you're skinny like me, you could probably fit through this gap. If you're not, you're probably going to have to use the electrical adjustment to move the backrest forward. And then it's very easy to climb in. Then, once you're in the third row of the Innova, you'll realize just how much space you have here. Now, the High Cross's third row is a three-seater. It's the only car in this test that has a three-seater in the third row. You can tell that because there is a belt in the roof for the third person over here. Now, in terms of space in the third row, it's actually generous. You look at the second row, it's set to a middle position. I can move this much more forward to liberate a lot more room, but then you're compromising space in the second row. This is a reasonable compromise. There's enough space in the second row and there's enough space for me over here. The beauty of the High Cross is that every single row can have passengers, adult passengers who are comfortable. In terms of features in here, there's not much going on. You don't have a separate blower zone like the Safari or the XUV. You just have vents which are controlled from the center, the second row. That aside, it's a spacious place. It's a comfortable place. If you are going to be spending a lot of time in the third row, the Innova is the car that I would recommend. Now let's look at the high cross's boot space. Electrically operated boot. You put this in here and you've got a ton of room. You can even fit this horizontally. You've got that much space in the back of the high cross with all three rows up. And you can flip them down very easily. They fold completely flat. And then you put so much more room in the back of the high cross. Swapping from the high cross to this safari, it feels like the road presence has gone up a notch. Just look at this thing. Of course, design is subjective, but the Safari, it turns heads. And it's the oldest SUV in this lineup. It was launched in 2021. It is due for a refresh very soon. But still, the Safari, it looks really cool. This red dark edition with a blacked out front grille, black wheels, it looks really, really cool. Amongst all the MPVs, SUVs in this test, the Safari is actually the oldest and it should feel hopelessly outclassed considering the pace of progress in this category. Except with the red dark treatment that Tata Motors have applied on the Safari, this looks the most premium, the most appealing. Now, okay, styling is personal and what I like you might not like and vice versa. But this blacked out Safari, the black interiors, these red seats, which reminds me of Porsches. All those Porsches that I lusted after when I was growing up, all of those had that red cabins, red seats, red everything. That's what I've always grown up wanting to own. And now you get a Safari with red seats, a Safari that reminds you of a Porsche. How cool is that? And honestly, the way they've done this also, so tastefully, all the chrome, 
taken out so it is fully de-chromed even the tata logo on the steering box that is black there's just a bit of dark chrome for the door handles but overall this is classily done really well executed and of course it has those much much needed upgrades chiefly the infotainment screen so now you get a much larger infotainment screen it is loaded with connectivity features so wireless apple carplay android auto it's got an air purifier with an aqi index it also has adas features and that is the xuv 700 effect all those features that the 700 came loaded with now tata motors have also loaded it on the safari this has everything it's got a very sweet sounding jbl stereo in fact this stereo is much better than the hycross the hycross also has jbl speakers branded speakers but the safari sounds much better this has got ambient lighting it also has that mood lighting around the sunroof so that gives it a really cool touch all the red ambient lighting the red lighting around the sunroof the black to contrast with it a very cool cabin it's strange but i really really like the cabin of the safari and remember this is not the facelift to the safari there is a facelift coming by my estimate the earliest it will be diwali of this year but i think it will be next year that the facelift is applied to the safari and that facelift has got that new pattern of the lights which will be on the corners of the bumper unlike what is there right now on the safari and that will be a family look that will also be applied onto the nexon but anyway that is some time away right now if you want a safari you get a bitching car a really cool gangster machine if you option the red dark and of course if you want chrome tata motors will also give you a version with chrome i'm sure they will also have that version where you get you see lane change it will warn you but it will not push you into your lane because they can't because of this hydraulic power steering and actually that brings me to the one big criticism on the safari and that is the steering this steering it's heavy yet it doesn't give you that much feel and you're constantly making small small corrections so when you're overtaking at speed on the highway when you just have your fast lane that's when you want something that is precise where you can position it correctly whereas with the safari you're constantly correcting it's not accurate you're never 200% sure of where you are on the road and that i don't like it's a matter of getting used to because after a day of driving the safari then you're fine you don't even notice it but it is an issue the steering is something that all of you guys have complained about and rightly so and i think the problem is endemic to the platform because tata motors have worked on this platform with the bs 6.2 updates they have remapped the engine they have remapped the gearbox to make it smoother so they have done work on it it's not like they can't work on it but maybe this is something that they can't really address as for the engine this is the 2 liter diesel engine that has been there in the safari right since the beginning 167 bhp 350 newton meters of torque and that's where the comparison with the xuv 700 comes in the 700 has 450 newton meters of torque it has around 20 bhp more power and it clearly is quicker 0 to 100 is more or less the same but then when you're making fast progress on the highway the 700 it feels easier to make that quick progress there's less effort that you have to expend into the 700 to make quick overtakes to maintain a fast clip on the highway you need to put in more effort into this you need to work a little bit more with the safari it's not fingertip light and that's not something that you will complain about on the highway in fact this is something that you will enjoy in the highway the weightiness of the steering but in the city that's when the safari it becomes a little cumbersome to drive the updates to the safari also include a digital cluster so you got a lot of information out there it is also done really well and this is an example that toyota should look at the way tata motors have done their digital cluster it is not a full width cluster like in the xuv 700 that is a little more expensive looking and feeling but the way they have done the cluster 
Toyota should actually look at this because this seems and looks high quality. The Toyota cluster doesn't seem very high quality, even though the Toyota cluster is full color. The Safari has been engineered by people who know India, the Land Rover derived platform. The Safari, it feels robust, it feels tough, it feels like it can take that beating without anybody complaining inside the car or the car falling apart. So this feels solid. It really does make a difference when the going gets bad and over smooth roads, this can chug along really well. Though that said, you never have completely smooth roads in India, even though this is a brand new road, there are ripples and all of that, you can't feel it in the Safari. I did not feel that in the XUV or the High Cross. In the High Cross, there was a bit of float, that softness in the suspension, you could feel it. Whereas the XUV 700, it stayed planted. The body, flat, stable, it's beautiful. The Safari would probably be a 9 out of 10 if the XUV is a 10 out of 10. But I think the Safari, it makes up for all of that in terms of its sheer desirability. Okay, around corners, the Safari is also not as good as the XUV. There is a bit more body roll. The steering, it sort of wriggles in your hand. Small ripples or bumps in the road also deliver some amount of kickback on the steering. And it also doesn't have as much grip as the 700. The 700 actually feels enthusiastic. Whereas here, you are holding on. So where the Harrier is obviously focused at people who want to drive themselves, the Safari, you can enjoy driving it and you will really love being driven in it. After the High Cross, the Safari is the next best to be driven in. And of course, the Safari with all this SUV tushan that it has, it is a much cooler thing to own. The High Cross is sensible, but the Safari, it can do almost everything that the High Cross does, yet it looks cool. It appeals to your heart as well as your head. And of course, there's that huge amount of pride with buying Indian these days. Now, the second row of the Tata Safari, much like the Toyota High Cross, you do get captain seats in the second row. And these are actually very nice seats. They're wide. They've got good support on the side. You've got these armrests over here. And something I really like are these aircraft style headrests, which you can twist forward to support your neck if you want to pass out or sleep. You've also got ventilation in the second row. These seats are ventilated in three stages. It's a really neat feature and a must have in India, honestly. In terms of space, I've got good amount of space. This is the seat in its most rearwards position and headroom is good as well. The seat can recline, so it can go so far back, which is actually fairly comfortable. And you can put it back up if you want to sit more upright. Apart from that, there's not too much features in here. So you've got a type A USB and a type C USB at the bottom over there. You've got your AC vents in the pillars over here. But that aside, there's not much else. You don't have sun blinds or a tray like you have in the Innova High Cross. That said, the fundamentals here are sound. You've got good space and you're sitting really high up. The Tata Safari seating position in the second row is fairly tall. So you're looking over the driver, which is not something you can say for any of the other cars here. The third row of the Tata Safari. Now, unlike the High Cross, this is strictly a two-seater. You've got two seats over here and no more space for anything else. In terms of room, this is fairly cramped when the seat is in its fully back position. Now, if I move the seat to a position that's a compromise, it's comfortable enough for the person in front and for me, here. This is the sort of space I have. At this position, there is enough legroom for the person in the middle row. And I have a couple of inches of free legroom, which is nice. In terms of headroom as well, one or two inches over here, which is enough. I'm 5'10", I'm comfortably seated over here. The issue with the third row is the seat is very low down and the floor is fairly high up. So my knees are in an upright position and the seats lack under thigh support. That is sort of the only drawback of the seats in the Tata Safari in the third row. In terms of features in the third row, I've got blower adjustability over here. I've got cup holders. I've got a neat little pocket for my phone. And I've even got two USB ports dedicated for the third row along with these Acorn vents. Now let's talk about the boob space of the Tata Safari. 
get this open. This is a regular cabin size bag. You put it here and you'll realize that the safari's boot won't shut. You see, they've moved the third row so far back into the rear overhang that there's no boot space left. If you want to fit a bag in the third row of the safari, you're going to have to give up your third row, then put your luggage on the inside. The XUV700 has arguably the best proportions of all the SUVs in this comparison test. It looks like a proper, proper SUV with an aggressive front end, a nice bulging bonnet and a few key details that are really cool like the flush door handles that go on this car. What I like though is that it's got a lot of presence. The LED DRLs in the front a little too much but at the back those turn indicators the dynamic turn indicators, they're really lovely and they look especially cool at night. Many claim, but few are genuinely game changers. The XUV700 definitely is a game changer. When this was launched last year, it actually rewrote the rules of the game in the premium mid SUV category. Here was a Mahindra that actually bested Hyundai and Kia in terms of features, plus Mahindra, they doubled down on their reputation for performance, for safety and for driving enthusiasm. So in this test, the XUV700 is the safest SUV. Until the new global NCAP regulations came up this year, this, the XUV700 was the safest car to be made in India as tested by global NCAP. So if you're looking for a safe car, and safety should be a priority. Whatever you look at, safety should be a real strong priority. So in terms of safety, this one wins this test. End of story, stop watching the video, go and book yourself an XUV700. Done that? Okay, so now let's get going. When the XUV700 was launched, Mahindra made a big deal about the torsional rigidity of this monocoque platform. They claimed it bested the Skoda Kodiak and that delivered in terms of ride comfort and in terms of handling. Plus, the rear suspension, it's a proper five-link independent rear suspension with a control arm and stage two FSD dampers. Nothing else in this test has got such a sophisticated suspension setup. The Safari, for instance, it has a torsion beam at the rear, a regular torsion beam. It claims to have a platform that is derived from Land Rover, but the suspension is a proper torsion beam. This one has got independent five link with the control arm with stage two FSD dampers. And that means the ride comfort is excellent. The handling is also excellent. So earlier this morning, I swapped from the High Cross into the XUB 7 w the ride comfort was similarly good and yet it didn't float around like the high cross was on these highways the 7 w it remains flat planted stable no vertical movement no squish in the suspension it just goes over all kinds of roads really really well this honestly is just super impressive in terms of its dynamic ability the balance that they've got between ride comfort and handling is unmatched in this test. The steering, now this is electric power steering and when we did our earlier tests and comparison with the XUV700, I said that the steering, it needed to be a little bit more weighty, a little bit heavier would actually give you more of a sense of confidence in the 7 w that opinion doesn't change but also the fact remains that in making the steering so light that has made the 7 w super easy to drive in city in traffic this is a breeze it's actually zero effort like the high cross the 7 w also driving around in the city is just super easy you would think a big car would be cumbersome to drive in the city but on the contrary a big car, at least in my opinion, is easier to drive in the city than a smaller car because in a bigger car, you have some might and that lets you exercise your right of way. The 7 w it also has the performance to really stretch the limits of the chassis. 
Now, what we're driving is the diesel. You can also get a petrol. That is the two liter turbo petrol engine. Both are mated to the six speed torque converter automatic gearbox. You can get the diesel with the option of all wheel drive petrol. It only gets front wheel drive. This is the front wheel drive diesel. But like I said, you can also get all wheel drive if you so wish. Now, this diesel engine, the immediate difference with the high cross is that it feels more energetic. The torque is significantly more. 450 newton meters of torque. In terms of power, it is more or less the same, 182 bhp on the 7W, but 450 newton meters of torque, and that makes it more effortless to drive on the highway. So, quick driving on the highway, the 7W, it masks speeds so well that you don't really feel that you're driving fast. You can just chew in the miles so quickly, so effortlessly, and in absolute safety. The ride, handling, stability at speed, stability over all kinds of roads, it just fills you with so much confidence. The 7W also is brimming with equipment. So you get these power seats, which have got this Mercedes style controller. You get this big slab of digital real estate, which again is inspired by Mercedes, wireless CarPlay, lots of connectivity features, a superb Sony sound system, big panoramic sunroof. The only thing that's really missing are ventilated seats. It's a strange omission, but it is an omission. But otherwise, the 7W has everything. It also has ADAS features, including forward collision warning and braking. In fact, it's after Mahindra really loaded the 7W with all these features. That's when everybody else, the competition, they actually had to pull up their socks and start offering everything that the 7W had offered. And that's why the Safari has become so much better. In fact, all you Tata fanboys, all you Safari fanboys have Mahindra to thank for, for the updates to the Safari, for actually giving you the Safari Red Dark with all those features. Let's look at the way it goes around corners. The body control is of a very high order and you don't feel nervous throwing it around these fast sweepers on the highway. Excellent dynamics. So the 7 you get performance, you get ride, you get handling, you get tons of features, you get something that's really stylish also and that's reflected in the sales numbers. Today, you see more 7 00s on the road than you see safaris. This is doing extremely well in terms of numbers. It is visible on the road. People are happy with it. And it is a fantastic example, a fantastic representation of what Indian engineering is capable of. A five-star SUV. Damn good. Now the second row of the XUV 700. The XUV it's available as a 5-seater or a 7-seater. There is no 6-seater option available with captain seats. This AX7L variant is exclusively available as a 7-seater though. So you get this bench and you get a third row at the back. In terms of space, I've got a good amount of knee room. I've got a generous amount of headroom. It is fairly comfortable and the floor is also reasonably flat despite this being four-wheel drive. So I've got a good amount of space for my feet. In terms of creature comforts, you do get a boss mode here. Though it's not electrically operated, this is manual. So you can push the front seat in front. And that's about it. You get a USB-C type port, a little slot for your phone. You get blowers in the second row, though no controls for the blowers. And the usual business, you get an armrest, cup holders, door pockets, all the regular stuff that you would expect of SUVs in this class. In terms of adjustability for the seat though, there are no rails, so you cannot slide the second row forward. What you can do is recline this back and forward depending on the position that you want it to be in. Now getting into the third row of the SUV is super easy because of the one touch tumble feature. So you pull this lever up once and this flips all the way back and you can get inside. Now let's talk about the third row of the 700. In terms of seats, you get two seats just like in the Tata Safari. But in terms of space, you don't get as much. My knees are riding up against the second row and there's no adjustability in terms of the it's sliding forward on rails. So I'm stuck with this and 
the roof as well it's fairly low if i sit up straight my head rides up against the roof over here there's really not much room for adults in here but in terms of features you do get a blower setting along with vents and you get a 12 volt socket and cup holders so this is okay for children it's okay for shorter people but i'm 5'10 and i don't fit in here a boot space on the xv700 same bag put it in here and it shuts unlike the safari the xv700 actually has a reasonable amount of space in the boot so you can fit a single bag if you want to extend it it's really simple sir that goes down there and you've got a much larger boot so boot space on the xv700 is better the third row may be a compromise but you do get a little added practicality over here Hyundai has done a great job with the packaging of the Alcazar. But on the outside, this is the smallest car in this group at four and a half meters long. The wheelbase, though, is on par with its rivals. And on the design front, you can see the nice chrome front grille, these dual tone alloy wheels, and the blacked out C pillar that disguises the length of the car. Overall, it's not got the road presence of the other SUVs, but the Alcazar still looks quite smart. The Alcazar has just been updated with the new 1.5 liter turbo petrol engine. So gone is the old 2 liter naturally aspirated petrol and if you remember our past test of the Alcazar, we said that that engine it really wasn't great. It was a bit sluggish, not as responsive. The only reason Hyundai put it there was for that perception that customers would think that a 2 liter engine is more premium than a 1.5. forget the fact that one is turbocharged and the other is naturally aspirated but turns out customers also seem to know their business they know what they want and that's why there's the 1.5 turbo petrol this is not that 1.5 turbo petrol we haven't yet driven that engine we've only driven that engine in the verna but not in the alcazar what we have here is the 1.5 diesel engine and that means in terms of power and particularly in terms of torque this is a bit outclassed in this test it makes 113 bhp 250 newton meters of torque 250 versus 450 on the xuv and the safari so there is a fair bit of difference but the alcazar is lighter it is smaller and in terms of outright performance it does 0 to 100 in 11 and a bit seconds to the 10 odd seconds that the xuv and the safari do to 100 so it is not that far off it is not hopelessly outclassed and in fact there is one huge huge benefit of this smaller diesel engine and that is fuel efficiency so before coming to our shoot location we reset the trip meters of all the cars out here the diesels they were showing around 13 and a half to 14 kmpl the safari showed almost 15 kmpl and this is showing 22 kmpl so a huge difference in terms of fuel efficiency the alcazar it will save you a lot of money in terms of running costs and the alcazar is also cheaper to own plus you have the backing of Hyundai service network you know that these cars the quality is good the reliability is good the alcazar after all is based on the creta and it is for good reason that the creta is the best selling mid size suv in the country in fact the creta is the default mid size suv so the provenance of the alcazar the dna of the alcazar is of a very very high standard now compared to the creta the alcazar is not just got a longer rear overhang that's what tata motors did with the safari they just extended the rear overhang of the harrier and created the safari whereas with the alcazar the platform has been extended so the wheelbase is longer compared to the creta and obviously the rear overhang is also longer to accommodate that third row of seats but this is not the most spacious in this class Atish will talk about that in a bit the interiors the way it has been designed the quality the equipment levels all of that are top notch the only thing this lacks compared to the XUV and the Safari are ADAS features and i'm sure that will come if the Verna can get ADAS 
there's nothing stopping the Alcazar from getting it very soon. And even the Creta from getting it very soon. You get a huge sunroof. You get these nice seats which are also cooled. The XUV seats aren't cooled. You even get these paddle shifters which neither the XUV nor the Safari get. The digital cluster, the quality of the graphics, the resolution, very, very good. The infotainment, well, Hyundai does these things really well. In fact, the others have a hard time matching up to Hyundai's very high standards. And you get everything. Only thing lacking is wireless CarPlay. The overall design of the dash, the layout, that's also very nice. You get captain seats in the middle, which are also cooled. So overall, equipment levels are first class. The Bose sound system, it sounds excellent. The refinement of the diesel engine is top notch. This has got the best refinement. Here, you can barely hear the diesel engine. In the XUV and the Safari, you can hear the diesel engine. Here, barely. The gearbox is very well mated to the torque curve of the engine. So, it's very rare that it actually feels trained. It's only when you're trying to make a quick overtake, like right now, now you're stepping on it, that's when you feel that, okay, now it needs a little bit power. But otherwise, while cruising, it is fine. So surprising as it might sound, I don't really have a issue with the engine because it seems well sorted to the Alcazar. What I don't like about the Alcazar is that in the extending of the platform, in the revised geometry of the rear suspension, they've actually ruined the ride comfort of the Creta and also the handling of the Creta. So this doesn't drive as well as the Creta does. We all like the way the Creta drives, but the Alcazar, it drives differently from the Creta. It feels a bit more cumbersome. The ride comfort isn't there. In fact, the platform, it can't take these big wheels. These wheels are just too big for the abilities of this platform. And that's why it feels stiff over bad roads. You get a solid jolt from the rear. So that is something that I don't like about the Alcazar. If you feel the Safari and the XUV are too big, the Alcazar will probably suit you. You sit a little lower, it feels more compact. It is smaller also and it is easier to drive if you're not used to big cars. If you like a smaller car to squeeze around in city traffic, the Alcazar will work better for you. Round smooth corners, the Alcazar, it can carry a fair bit of pace, but it's not very enjoyable. This car has done around 30,000 kilometers and things are squeaking, center panel squeaking a bit, so maybe it is used also heavily, but not robust in terms of build quality. And that's why you buy a Toyota, right? Because you know that no matter what, nothing is going to happen to it. And of course, it doesn't feel as much and macho as the 700 and especially the Safari. Even when you park it next to them, the Alcazar gets dwarfed. So this seems like a much smaller premium mid SUV. And also the space. So over to Atish to talk about the space. Second row of the Hyundai Alcazar. Now, you do get captain seats here. Again, this is a six-seater, not a seven-seater. And in terms of space, you've got adequate amount of room. So, in terms of knee room, just a little bit free, but a good amount of headroom. Now, the issue here is you get this tray table. Practical, but a little bit of space has been sacrificed for this practicality because it eats into about two inches of your knee room. The other cars on this test, they have generous amounts of knee room. I'd say the Alcazar's knee room is about adequate. You do get this seat on rails though, so you can move this ahead and back if you need to, to make more space in the rear. And what I like the most about the Alcazar second row is that it really pampers you. So you've got these soft neck pillows, stuff that you get on the S-Class and 7 Series. And it's really nice to sink into. You can really get comfortable in here. This center console, again, a neat touch. You've got storage, you've got a wireless phone charger, you've got cup holders, well within reach. It's really nicely done. Apart from that, you've got a USB-A type port, another little cubby hole here, blower vents in the back, and this. 
You've got these blinds which cut out the sun, cut out the heat and make the Alcazar's back seat a really cozy place to be. Space may not be the best but this place really pampers you. So the third row of the Alcazar is fairly easy to get into. Again, you've got a one-touch function. So you do this and it lifts itself all the way up leaving this large aperture. The Alcazar has really long doors to get inside. And once you're inside, you realize space is limited. With the second row in its furthest back position, I can't even get my knees inside behind the second row. But if I move it slightly forward, okay, I can squeeze it here. But then again, I'm compromising knees in the second row. If you remember, the Alcazar doesn't have a lot of knee room in the second row free. So the second you move this forward, you're going to be compromising knee room there. But here, space is tight. My knees are grinding up against the second row seat. Headroom is okay. I can fit upright without a problem. But the knee room is really not good enough for an adult. Maybe kids can fit in here, but not much else. In terms of creature comforts, you've got blowers, you've got USB, you've got cup holders. And I mean, it's not like it matters because this is not a place where you want to find yourself. A boot space in the back of the Alcazar. Open it up and you've got a fair amount of room in here. You can fit the bag in here comfortably. It doesn't even touch the scuff plate at the base over here. This is spacious even with three rows up. Hold this down though and you can comfortably put it in here. And the space in the Alcazar at the boot is not too bad. Third row space, not great. Boot, I'll give it a thumbs up. One of the key reasons for the Currents winning the Car of the Year award is that it offers solid value for money. Suresh is going to talk to you a lot more about that. But even on the outside, when you look at it, it doesn't feel like it's the cheapest car in this comparison test. You get these beautiful black surrounds around the headlamps. You get a lot of chrome where it matters, like the door sills and the door handles that feel premium when you look at them. Overall, the Currents feels quite desirable with all that is going on. Only thing is that it's got smaller 16 inch wheels compared to the 18 inches on almost all the cars in this comparison test. The Currents, it demonstrates the differing schools of thought between the Hyundai and Kia cousins. So where Hyundai have been focused, obsessed with making SUVs, Kia, they've said that, okay, SUVs might be desirable, MPVs might not be so desirable, but Indians, they do want MPVs. They do want something that can cart the entire family. So why not give them an MPV? Why do we have to always follow the SUV template and then make compromises? And that's what the Kerens is. Unashamedly an MPV and all the better for it. So because this now is a proper MPV, they've managed to give proper space inside the cabin. Atish will delve more into the space inside the Currents. I want to talk about the comfort. SUVs, they have to have big wheels to give them those SUV feels. Whereas an MPV, it does not need big wheels. So where the Alcazar, it gets 18 inch wheels and the ride quality is ruined because of that. The Currents, it does with just 16 inch wheels. It doesn't look very cool, but that doesn't matter because the ride comfort is very good. It's excellent. The handling is okay, it's nothing so great, but then an MPV is not really used to fling it round corners, so it's fine. I think the compromise is a compromise that is well worth making because the positioning of the Karens is absolutely clear. This is supposed to be comfortable. This is supposed to have good space, especially in the middle row with the captain seats in the middle row and it does everything very well. The Karenz's pricing advantage is also down to the fact that the Alcazar is based on the Creta slash Celtos platform, whereas the Karenz has more in common with the Sonnet than it does with the Celtos, and that's why they've been able to hold the price point, price it attractively, and appeal to a far wider audience. And of course, this being the Hyundai Kia Group, they've given it everything. In terms of equipment, this is loaded. The only thing you don't get is a panoramic sunroof. You just get a normal size sunroof. In terms of engines, Kia are transitioning to BS 6.2 powertrains. So as of now, the Kerens is not available with a diesel engine. What we're driving right now is the old 1.5 diesel, which just suits the character of the Kerens very well. 
when the Currents was launched, our long-term test Currents was the 1.5 with the automatic gearbox, great on fuel efficiency, good enough on performance. We really loved it, used it all over the place, really loved it, very practical, very versatile. Now you can get the new 1.5 litre turbo petrol engine, it makes 157 bhp and considering that the Currents is light, that will make the Currents quick, like properly quick. Of course, you aren't really begging for more power in an MPV, but the more the merrier. You also get paddle shifters on the Kerens. So, all the equipment that you see on the Alcazar, you also get on the Kerens. And the reason why you see more Kerens on the road than the Alcazar is obviously number one pricing and number two, because the focus is right. The digital cluster, that's an old school cluster that gives away its provenance that has been derived from the Sonnet, from smaller cars, not the bigger cars. But again, it's fine. And at the price, what you get with the Currents is very, very good value. If you want a big seven-seater, of course, the High Cross. But if you don't want to stretch your budget that much, yet you have to accommodate seven. And you want something that doesn't make you feel like you've scringed on money. The Kia Currents, it works very well. So anyway, let's toss to Atish and talk about the space in the Karens. The second row of the Kia Karens. Again, it's available as a six-seater and a seven-seater. This is the six-seater with captain seats in the middle row. And in terms of space, there's actually a reasonable amount of space. Much like the Alcazar though, this, this is the air purifier. It eats into the leg room that you have on offer. Right now, my seat is in the most rearward position. I can bring it forward a little more to make more space for the guys at the back. And this is still comfortable. There's a lot of space under the front seats to tuck my feet into. And I can sit here without trouble. In terms of other features, you've got a tray table. The same ones out of the Alcazar in here, the Karens over here. You've got your fan adjustability up to four speeds. You've got two USB slots and a tray at the bottom over here. Another neat touch is this. Despite being the most affordable of the bunch, it gets features like the sunshade that really make the cabin in the back a lot more comfortable. Now let's step into the third row and see what that's like. Of all the five cars, getting into the third row of the Karens is actually the easiest. It's the most effortless to get this seat down. One button, press that, and the thing tumble forward on its own, and I just have to climb inside. It's by far the best design, the most ingenious solution. In terms of third row space, you can see two people over here, just like all of the others on this test, except for the high cross. But in terms of outright space, I've got about an inch of free knee room for my knees. And that is with the seat in its slightly forward setting, where I have just about enough space in the second row. Headroom is actually generous. There's a good amount of headroom. And overall, I can sit here very comfortably. I think one critical bit is the fact that the floor is low down and the seats are slightly high up. So I'm not sitting with that knee up position. This seating position is a lot more comfortable I have a lot more support towards my back, towards my knees. I can put my feet slightly forward and it's fairly comfortable. In terms of features, there's USB Type-C ports and there's cup holders on both ends. And overall, I think the Karenz's third row is great for the sort of value that the Karenz is offering. Now let's talk about the boot space of the Kia Karenz. It's already impressed us on the inside. And the boot space is actually very good. Second only to the Innova Micros. This will actually shut with that bag in there. You can obviously extend this as well. Again, simple mechanism. Just drop it down. And then you've got even more room in the back of the Karens. If you're looking for value for money in this test, the Karens is excellent. It is the cheapest in this test. It's almost 11 lakh rupees cheaper than the High Cross Hybrid. Okay, granted, the Karens is smaller, has got a smaller engine and all of that. But still, including all of that, the Karens is still brilliant for value for money and it is a proper seven-seater MPV. But if the whole MPV body style doesn't vibe with you, then for two lakh rupees more, you get the Alcazar. It looks like an SUV, but it has almost everything that the Karens has to offer. So that's it. Between the two, I would go for the more sensible Karens. Then you move up in terms of pricing, the XUV 700 and the Safari. The XUV, it has more power, it has got better performance, it has got better ride and handling. It also is easier to drive with a lighter steering. 
The Safari, it has got that rugged Land Rover derived underpinnings. The middle row is more comfortable. You get captain seats in the middle row, which you don't get in the XUV. You also get more space in the third row. And of course, it is great to drive. The two are very closely matched. But if push comes to shove, I would pick the XUV 700 for the simple reason that it scores a full five stars in the global NCAP crash safety ratings. And then you have the high cross. Now, Toyota really asks for quite a bit with the high cross. It's almost five lakhs more than both the XUV and the Safari. But at that price, you get the most amount of space. All seven, in fact, eight people can fit in comfortably. The ride quality is brilliant. The powertrain refinement is superb, but it is a petrol and the running costs aren't the same as diesel. So overall, the pricing is on the higher side. You're looking at around five lakh rupees more for the high cross hybrid compared to both the XUV as well as the Safari. But if you want a seven-seater, the Innova Hycross is still your pick.